Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. It's time to have a look at the user mission which is made by Alaska. And also I'll leave a link in the description if you want to give it a go. And this one is for the Bakum BA-349 NATA. Now the NATA was a rocket powered interceptor known as basically a wonder weapon for the Germans during the Second World War. But it never really went anywhere. Um, <laughs> it was never used in operational combat. It was generally designed to and nearly got there, but unfortunately uh, didn't and never really had its baptism of fire. Instead, um, it's basically just a tube with a bunch of rockets attached to it. And I thought just to uh, kind of uh, explain to you um, the history of the NASA, I would use the Warplanes of the Third Reich book by William Green, which I think is one of the best books out there to be able to pick up about German vehicles. How do I feel about this plane being in game? I mean, I suppose it could be some kind of weird and wonky uh, machine uh, that they could add in um, to, uh, to the game to uh, be an AI as like an objective or maybe as a kill streak or something like that uh, would be quite cool. But as an actual vehicle to be used, I don't think it would have too much functionality. But then again, the BI exists, so anything's possible. Let's get into the history of the vehicle. By the spring of 1944, it had become evident to the German High Command that the steadily escalating daylight offensive against the industries of the Third Reich being mounted by the US AAF could no longer be countered by orthodox means alone. So serious was the situation that careful consideration had to be given to the unorthodox, and there was no shortage of highly ingenious schemes for intercepting and destroying the intruding bomber formations, but few withstood more than cursory examination of their practical ability. One radical proposal, which did appear to offer some possibility of success, however, was that submitted by DIPL ING, the Eric Backham, who suggested an inexpensive, vertically launched, semi expendable, rocket propelled target defense interceptor. Backham's proposals were not entirely original, in that the idea of the rocket powered, vertically launched interceptor had been proposed to the technician AMT of the RLM as early as the summer of 1939, only to be rejected as too radical. Where the Backham project differed was in its semi-expendability. Its keynote was simplicity, workmanship and material quality being consciously sacrificed to achieve this end. Low-grade, non-essential materials were to be used throughout and while the airframe would perform but one operational mission, its rocket motor would be retrieved for reuse. The vertically launched rocket-powered target defense interceptor concept was first propounded by Dr. Werner von Braun in a memorandum sub submitted to the technician AMT on the 6th of July 1939. Von Braun envisaged an aircraft weighing 11,145 pounds at takeoff and propelled by a single 22,050 pound thrust bifuel rocket. This was to take off vertically from two 19.7 foot guide rails, and it was calculated that an operational altitude of 26,250 feet would be attained within 53 seconds. Although the scheme was discarded as impracticable by the RLM, the concept captured the imagination of Backham, then technical director of the Gerhard Faisal uh, Werk, who prepared a series of interceptor design studies under the generic designation, the FI-166. These two were rejected by the RLM, but Backham maintained close con contact with Dr. Von Braun and biofuel rocket motor development at Pienemund. And when, in the late spring of 1944, the RLM issued a requirement for a small and inexpensive target defense interceptor. He submitted a proposal which he designated the BP-20 NATA, or the ADA. Numerous projects were submitted to the technician AMT of the RLM the, uh, to meet the demands of the new requirement, 
and in the final evaluation during the early summer, a Heinkel proposal, the Project 1077 Julia, was selected as the winning contender, while the NASA was rejected out of hand. Backham's proposal have been uninvited and in any case submitted for consideration through abnormal channels. Backham had enlisted the aid of General der Jagdflieger Adolf Garland, who had himself passed the NASA project to the RLM. But in defense of the technician Amt, it should be stated that Backham's project did not meet the demands of the requirement, which did not envisage partial loss of the interceptor after each mission. However, convinced of the feasibility of his project, Backham had no intention of accepting defeat in this fashion, and promptly applied for and was granted an interview with no lesser personage than Heinrich Himmler. Himmler displayed immediate interest in the NATO project, promised his full personal support, and within 24 hours, Backham had been informed by the technician Amt that it had reconsidered its earlier rejection of the NATO project, which was now to be received the highest development pr pr priority. A small factory had been acquired in Waldsee in the Svarsland, uh, or Svarswald, sorry, and Backham was joined by H. Beth uh, Bedder, formerly a technical director of the Dornier Werk. The Walterwerk at Kiel uh, provided a rocket motor specialist, uh, ING Grassau, and in August 1944, work on the BP-20 NATO began in earnest. This development coming within the orbit of the uh, Jaeger Nord program, or the Fighter Emergency program, of the Technician Amt under Oberst uh, Nijemeyer and uh, receiving the official designation the BA-349. The definitive NASA differed in some respects to that originally proposed by Backham. The first scheme envisaged an initial attack on the bomber formation during which the NASA uh, would expend its battery of rocket missiles. The pilot, then using the remaining kinetic energy to gain sufficient height to perform a ramming attack in a dive. Immediately before impact, the pilot was to eject himself from the cockpit of the NASA. Activation of the ejection seats, triggering explosive bolts, which would detach the aft fuselage housing the rocket motor, a parachute being automatically deployed to lower this to the ground for retrieval and also reuse. Beth Bader concluded that the cockpit of the NASA was too small to permit the installation of an effective ejection seat. Furthermore, its provision would only serve to complicate a design which was intended to provide the essence of simplicity, and it was decided, therefore, to dispense of the ramming attack. The pilot jettisoning the forward fuselage com complete with windscreen after discharging his rocket missiles, this action releasing the parachute housing cover and also deploying the parachute. During the weeks that followed, detailed design was purposed or pursued in parallel with wind tunnel trials at Braunschweig. During uh, tunnel testing, speeds in excess of Mach 0.95 were simulated without the appearance of any adverse stability or compressionability effects. The entire airframe was of wooden construction, metal being used only for control pushrods, hinges and load supporting attachment points. The fuselage was of semi-monocoque uh, construction with laminated skin, stringers and formers, and the wing possessed a single laminated wooden spar, which was continuous from wingtip to wingtip and passed between the fuselage fuel tanks. The wing incorporated no movable surfaces, rolling control being obtained by differential operation of the uh, elevons, which formed part of the horizontal tail surfaces. The tail assembly might be described as of asymmetrical cruciform design in that the tailplane was mounted above the fuselage and the uh, vertical surfaces were extended below the fuselage. Large by comparison by the wing, the tailplane contributed an important proportion of the total lift, both wing and tailplane being of rectangular platform without dihedral taper or sweep. The wing utilized a symmetrical aerofoil Thickness uh, to cord being 12% and 
and maximum thickness being located at 50% cord. Alternative forms of armament considered during the initial development stage included a raw battery of 49 30mm SG-119 rocket shells and the cylindrical semi-automatic Trommel Garat of, uh, with 40 30mm shells but eventually a Binnen Vaba or Honeycone arrangement of hexagonal tubes for 73mm HS-217 Fon or Storm missiles or uh, quadrangular tubes or for 55mm R4M missiles was adopted. Whereas the Bean Vaba for the smaller missile tubes, an earlier arrangement of uh, 28 Fawn tubes being discarded owing to the inadequacy of exhaust gas venting arrangements which resulted in an explosion during the test firing. A jettisonable plastic fairing enclosed the forward end of the Bienvaba prior to firing. Considerable importance was attached to the provision of adequate uh, armor protection for the pilot and the forward uh, cockpit bulkhead was provided by an armor plate which was cut away at the base in order that the pilot's feet could reach the rudder pedals which were positioned one on each side of the Bienvaba. Sandwich type armor was provided on each side of the pilot's seat and aft protection was provided by the rear armor bulkhead, dividing the cockpits from the fuel tanks. Instrumentation was Spartan and the rocket's firing sight consisted solely of a ring sight projecting from the nose head and of the cockpit. Immediately after the rear cockpit bulkhead was the two fuel tanks, the tank above the wing spar accommodating 95.6 uh, imperial gallons of T-Stoff, 80% hydrogen peroxide plus oxyquinoline uh, as a stabilizer, and the tank below the spar housing 41.8 imperial gallons of C-Stoff, which was 30% hydrazine hydrate solution uh, in methanol and the Walter 509A1 rocket motor. For launching, the BA-39 was to be mounted on a near vertical 80-foot ramp, with the wing tips and the tip of the lower fin being strengthened to uh, run in the three guide rails. The ramp itself was pivoted at the base to enable the aircraft to be loaded in the horizontal position. As the thrust to weight ratio was marginally short of 1 to 1 and therefore insufficient for vertical takeoff, it was proposed to attach four 1102 pound per thrust uh, Schmidding solid fuel booster rockets to the rear fuselage. These firing for 10 seconds uh, after which they were to be jettisoned. It was calculated that the initial acceleration would not exceed 2.2 g, but the possibility of the pilot blacking out was safeguarded against by presetting the elevons for the requiring flight path while the BA-349 was still on the ramp. A three-axis autopilot ground controlled by radio link assuming guidance of the interceptor at an altitude of 550 to 600 feet, at which point the booster rockets would theoretically be jettisoned. At a range of one to two miles, from the target formation, it was intended that the pilot would override the autopilot control, jettison the nose cone to expose the rocket missiles, close with the bombers, fire the entire complement of missiles in one salvo, turn away from the formation and bail out. As the sole purpose of the, of the pilot was to direct the aircraft during the final phase of the attack, the scheme offered the possibility of the final phase of the attack um, being uh, em employing personnel without any training other than that which would be provided on a rudimentary ground rig. After, com after completing his attack, the pilot was to release his seat harness, uncouple the control column, and release the safety catches and mechanical connections holding the nose section. This would then fall away from the aircraft, complete with windscreen, instrument panel, forward bulkhead and rudder pedals, simultaneously releasing the parachute housed in the rear fuselage. The sudden deceleration resulting from the deployment of the chute would throw the pilot forward and clear of the aircraft and he would then descend by parachute in the normal way. 
Such was the impetuous or the impetus uh, placed behind the BA349 program that the first of, the, of an initial series of 50 Versuch models were completed at Worldsea within three months of the launching of the NATA project. At this stage, it was proposed to expend all 50 of the first batch of aircraft on the unpowered test phase, and the first gliding trials were performed near Herberg in November of 1944, the BA-349 being ballasted to a weight of 3,748 pounds and then towed to an altitude of approximately 18,000 feet behind a HE-111. The test pilot, Zubert, subsequently reported that stability was excellent and the controls and the controls light and effective at all speeds between 125 and 425 miles per hour. The first vertical launching of the with the pilotless BA349 was attempted on the 18th of December 1944. The MTF frame being fitted with the four Schmidding booster rockets, this test proved a complete failure. The BA-349, failing to leave the ramp as a result of the booster rockets, burning through the release, uh, the release cables. A second attempt was made four days later, and on this occasion the BA-349 left the ramp as planned and disappeared into the cloud base at an altitude of 2,460 foot. Ten more unmanned BA-349s were launched successfully, although it was ascertained that climbing speed attained by the time the booster rockets were jettisoned was insufficient to result in full control surfaces effectiveness. To remedy this defect, the vertical tail surfaces were subsequently redesigned, both upper and lower rudder proportions being almost doubled in cord, the lower portion also being substantially reduced in depth as was also the elongated ventral fin. The cord of the elevons was also increased and small water-cooled control vanes were introduced in the rocket exhaust orifice. These having a life of approximately 30 seconds by which time sufficient speed had been attained to render the normal control surfaces fully effective. These changes were introduced on the BA-349A V16 and all subsequent NASA's built. The original idea of using the first 50 airframes for gliding trials and pilotless launches had by this time been abandoned, uh, owing to the time factor, and something of the impetus placed behind the NASA program, as a result of Heinrich Himmler's support, had diminished. In fact, on the 22nd of December 1944, the day on which the first successful pilotless launching was made, a meeting in Berlin of the Entwicklung Hauptkommission, or the Chief Development Commission for Aircraft, concluded that neither the BA-349 or Project 1077 Julia held promise that development of the ME-263 should be expedited by all means, and that tests of the ME-262 with supplementary rocket propulsion should be pursued, as this aircraft might render all of the target defense interceptors superfluous. It was recommended that all work on Julia was suspended and that the development on the BA-349, although opposed on technical and tactical grounds, should be continued in view of the imminence of powered trials, but that all prepare preparations for serious productions should be discontinued. These uh, pronouncements of the uh, Entwicklungs Hauptkommission were no more than recommendations and in so far as the BA-349 was concerned, never implemented. But the NATO program was encountering problems unrelated to the disapproval of the Haupt Commission. It had been uh, ascertained that construction of the airframe demanded only 250 man-hours, and the interceptor could be built, for the most part, by semi-skilled and unskilled labor. A number of small woodworking shops in and around the Schwarzwald were producing laminated wooden components for the BA-349, but the behavior of the Schmidding booster rockets was proving unreliable, burning time and thrust varying, and several units exploding under test. The Patton 3-axis autopilot tended to be erratic and was proving difficult to synchronize, um, and promised deliveries of the Walter 509A rocket motor failed to materialize. 
In fact, the first Walter Power plant did not reach Backham until February of 1945. Thus, the first complete Natter could not be launched until the 25th of that month. For the initial test of the Walter 509A, installed a dummy pilot was seated in the cockpit. The BA-349 was launched successfully, and at a predetermined altitude, the nose section and power plant section broke away, and both the dummy pilot and the power plant descended safely by parachute. The RLM, impressed by the results of the test, demanded that piloted trials with the Walter 509A installed should commence immediately. Backham voiced his opinion that such tests were still premature, and in this he was supported by Professor Ruff of the DVL, but all objections were dismissed. And on the 28th of February, the, uh, the Ober uh, Lieutenant Lothar Siebert, who had volunteered to perform the first fully powered flight trials, was launched in a BA-349. The aircraft climbed to an altitude of approximately 1,650 feet. When the cockpit canopy suddenly detached itself, the aircraft turning over on its back and continuing to climb at a shallow angle of an altitude of some 4,800 feet, then nosing down and diving into the ground, exploding on impact. Subsequent investigation never furnished an entirely satisfactory explanation for the accident, but it was assumed that the canopy had not been properly locked prior to the takeoff and that Siebert had been knocked out. Despite the accident, tests continued, and other pilots volunteered to replace Siebert. Three successful manned tests were performed in rapid succession, and it was decided that the BA-349 had reached a sufficiently advanced stage in its trials for operational evaluation. Meanwhile, Backham and Beth Bedder, dissatisfied with the powered endurance of the NASA, had adapted the interceptor to take the Walter 509C, featuring an auxiliary cruising chamber. This, necessi this necessitated some revision of the aft fuselage to take the vertically disposed rocket pipes of the new power plant and for aerodynamic reasons, the lower contours of the fuselage were deepened marginally, this having the, in, uh, the incidental advantage of uh, providing space for the installation of two 30mm MK cannons, which had been proposed as an alternative armament for the FON or R4M rocket missiles. No attempt was made to increase fuel capacity, but for CG reasons, an attachment points of the booster's rockets were moved aft and provision was made for the replacement of the 1,102 pound units by two Schmidding 533 solid fuel rockets, each providing 2,205 pounds of thrust. The development designated BP-20B by the Backham, Verk, and BA-349B by the RLM was intended to supplant the initial model, the BA-349A, with the 51st aircraft, the A-series of the Natter thus being restricted to the original batch of Versunk uh, machines and the BA-349B becoming the actual production version. The B-series offered a powered endurance of 4.36 minutes at 495 miles per hour and 9,840 feet, as compared with 2.23 minutes at this altitude for the A-series. But launching weight was only 127 pounds greater and flying weight was virtually unchanged. In the event, only three Versucht uh, BA-349Bs interceptors were completed before work came to a standstill at uh, Voltsy. One of these actually being flown, although non-availability of the definitive booster rockets necessitated the retention of the 1,102 pound per thrust units. A total of 36 NATA interceptors were actually completed at Waldsee, of which 25 were flown, although uh, only seven of these with pilots. And in April of 1945, 10 A-series Natters were set up at Kirchheim near Stuttgart to await the arrival of US AAF bombers. In the event, Backham's ingenious uh, weapon was never to be blooded in action, for Allied tanks arrived in the vicinity of the launch sites before the expected bombers and the Natas were destroyed on their ramps to prevent them falling into enemy hands. 
That is the story of the Natter. As always, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Millie Draper, Juan the Panda, Nick R. Kupila, Carrion Crow, Gus Irenicus, Pyman, Merciless Reaper, Orange Tail, Teddy, Daniel Stanton, Moxie B. Young, Peter Grayling, Jerry Provolt, Bereen, Alan Hacker, Sem Arslan, Uncle Bean, Derek R., and Lafouche for supporting the channel.